The next speaker is Professor Srinivas from Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research. And he's a t the title of his talk is a finite presentation of the time fundamental group in positive characteristic. Please. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, uh, to this meeting, uh, nice meeting. I'm happy to be back in Trieste, a beautiful place. <coughs> I've come here a couple of times at least. I think lectured in this room also previously. Yeah. On a very different topic, but anyway, whatever it was. <coughs> so I'm going to talk, uh, report on some joint work with uh, Ellen Eno and Mark Schusterman. This work done during the COVID lockdown period. I've never met Mark Schusterman or talked to him. All correspondence has been entirely electronic because Ellen Eno knows everyone in mathematics and everywhere. So uh, one of those Erdos number type things. You know. So I've, uh, during the COVID period, l met in some fashion more than one mathematician through Ellen. It's been very interesting. Okay. So uh, background is this, let X, uh, be a connected algebraic variety to start with. Or an algebraically closed field K. Then I want to talk about the et al fundamental group of X. I'll just write it as pi 1 X. Strictly speaking, you're supposed to write a base point. I don't want to get into that. It's not so important for what I have to do. <coughs> so uh, some properties of this thing. This is a pro-finite topological group. Right? So it has a topology in particular. And uh, <coughs> finite quotients. finite group G correspond to <coughs> finite Galois, I should say G Galois, et al. covering spaces F white tracks. Right, so this is a et al covering space such that the corresponding extension of function fields is Galois and G is the Galois group. <coughs> now, if K, the ground field K is the complex numbers, there's another fundamental group. X is also a topological space in a natural way, so it has a topological fundamental group. And there's a relation between this algebraic fundamental group and the topological. And uh, let me write it like this. There's a group homomorphism from the topological fundamental group to the et al fundamental group. This is a pro-finite group. This is just an abstract group. So it will factor through the pro-finite completion. And it's a theorem that this is an isomorphism. Sometimes this is called a generalized Riemann. existence theorem. Though uh, mathematicians from Germany tell me this is the wrong reference. It's Hebarkeitzatz is the correct one. Removable singularities is the, actually the proper reference according to some people. Anyway, whatever it is. In the literature, it's always called Riemann existence theorem. I'm just using that. Now the point is, we know that pi 1 topological of Xc is a finitely presented group. Abstract group. Uh, 
uh, th th this can be proved in many ways. Uh, one is to argue that the space Xc as a topological space has the homotopy type of a finite CW complex. So in particular, if you take such a, a, a model of the space up to homotopy, you have one cells and two cells. The one cells give me generators, and the two cells give relations. That gives a presentation. I mean, there's nothing canonical about it. There are many ways to do it, but anyway, the finite presentation is clear. Therefore, this implies that the et al. fundamental group of X, defined algebraically, is a, pro, a finitely presented profinite group. Then there are some theorems comparing what happens, to, uh, telling you what happens to the algebraic fundamental group if you change the ground field from one algebraically closed field to another one. So you are able to, from this, deduce that if characteristic k is equal to 0, pi 1 x is finitely present. And the proof is compared with C. Let me not spell that out in detail at the moment. OK. So natural question is finite presentation in the profinite sense true also in characteristic P? It's a natural question. And I'm going to assume, well, let me get to that later. It is a conference related to characteristic P geometry, so it's natural to bring this in here. It's trying to be, uh, it seems a bit tough to find unbroken chalk. Okay. So let me state, okay, I, I need some terminology. A good compactification of a non singular variety X is a pair X bar D where X bar is smooth and proper. over the same ground field K. <laughs> and D in this X bar is a simple normal crossing divisor such that I've identified X, the original space, with the complement. So of course, naturally, then I think of X bar as a compactification of this X. So I need this terminology. And then let me state uh, the first main theorem. Let x be a smooth variety. OK, <coughs> such that there exists a good projective compactification of this X. Then the same fundamental group, I'll explain later what this is, but is financially presented.
as a profinite group. <coughs> In particular, Y1 X is finitely presented if X is smooth and protected. So, in some sense, even this was a new result uh, in the characteristic peak case. Let me write down a corollary, which will work out a little later with uh, Jacob Sticks and Martin Lara, if x over k is proper and connected, I suppose, then pi 1 x is finitely presented. I say corollary because in some sense, there is a machinery which is there in SGA, I'm sure Dale knows it very well, uh, which uh, allows you to write a kind of Van Kampen theorem if you have some sort of covering of the space X in some suitable sense. So here we would want some kind of hyper covering. So basically you would start with your X which is proper, you'll have an, a Y mapping to X which is let's say a Dijon style alteration and then you have a y1 lying over y and y2 and so on make some, some diagram. Then some of the properties of this diagram, and if you know finite presentation of the fundamental group for each of the terms appearing in the diagram, you can deduce it by some kind of abstract Van Kampen type result, which is there in some fact. Ah, Tim, we're not saying here this x is, x is proper here, there's no boundary. There's no boundary. I haven't said what is tame. I'm going to explain that. I, I said in particular, X is smooth and protected. If there's no boundary, exactly. Uh, so tame is to do with X, which is non-proper, and then I have to take a boundary and good compact, etc. Okay. Uh, this should have been obvious, I, I suppose, even to us. But uh, anyway, somehow it, this came a little later. Sticks is an expert on this Van Camper type descent stuff. So. So I'm not going to really talk more about this. It's a corollary of this with known machinery, but it's a little abstract uh, machinery, which is there in the literature. Yeah. The real thing is the smooth projective case. And uh, as uh, Dale is pointing out, there's something about tame. Yeah. Whether something like that, what is tame in, in the general case where you have singularities, we don't really understand. And so I think we don't have a good equivalent to the tame thing here in this more general context yet. I'll comment a bit about some of the issues with tameness afterwards. Okay. Now let me give you some background remarks about the theorem. First, there is some stuff related to this already in SGA. Uh, this says pi 1 x is finitely generated if x is smooth and protected. This is an old result of growth and And in fact, uh, as I understand, this uh, proof of this is one of the triumphs of growth and decultivate geometry, one of the early ones, which couldn't be done by other methods. And the style of argument is to use two things. Use Lefschetz hyperplane theorem for pi 1, which says uh, that if I take a curve C inside X, a smooth, complete intersection, implies pi 1 C 
maps onto pi 1 x. Well, this part of the Lefschetz theorem is actually uh, not so difficult to prove. It is essentially there in Hartshorn's book in some fashion, algebraic geometry, the lemma of Enriquez Severi, uh, somebody, uh, which says that an ample divisor is connected. Basically, that's the statement. So that implies things like this without much difficulty. So it's not very hard. But the second thing is, uh, so in other words, if I want to just prove finite generation, and if I know this is finitely generated, I deduce that one is finitely generated. So I have to do it only for curves. And for curves, the second step is um, growth and X specialization for pi 1. So here, the idea is that if you have your curve, uh, so suppose you have some curve C over spec lambda, where lambda is some complete deviat, and you have uh, then sort of its uh, spec k, the quotient field, and then pass to the algebraic closure. So I have a sort of generic fiber of this thing, geometric generic fiber, and I have the closed fiber, which is, let's say, my curve C in characteristic P. Uh, so this script C is some sort of lifting to characteristic 0 of the curve in characteristic P. Such a lifting always exists because obstructions to lifting uh, live in H2 of the space which you're trying to lift. C is a curve. It has no H2 of any reasonable sort of sheet, so there are no obstructions to lifting. Right? So uh, you can construct such a diagram. And then Grothendieck says that there's a, a homomorphism from pi 1 of this geometric generic fiber to the pi 1 of C, and it's rejected. This is called growth and specialization homomorphism. So if I want to get finite generation of this thing in characteristic P, I can deduce it if I know finite generation in characteristic 0. But in characteristic 0, pi 1x is always finitely presented even by comparison with the case of complex numbers. So I deduce that pi 1 of a smooth predictive variety in characteristic P is finitely generated. But of course, it's only a surjection each time. So you've lost the control of the relations. You don't know finite presentation. SGA, in fact, has a comment that quite possibly finite presentation is false for pi ones of curves in characteristic P. For, for this is like a fine curve. No, no, smooth projective curve. Uh, there's a speculation, but of course, our but theorem. That's not true, right, for a fine curve. So next comment. Absolutely, next comment. Absolutely. I'm going to discuss that next. Remark two. Dale has already anticipated me. <laughs> pi 1 of the affine line, not finitely generated. In fact, if you take uh, the first in fancy language, et al. cohomology with uh, Z mod PZ coefficients, this is harm of uh, this pi 1 A1, k abelianized into Z mod PZ is uh, infinite dimension, is an infinite dimension, k vector space. from art and trial theory. <coughs> so concretely, uh, I can think of coverings of A1 to A1 uh, given by equations like y to the p minus y equals x raised to m. And I can take uh, mi, some integers, assume p doesn't divide any of the mi's, and m1 less than, less than mn, let's say, take n of these guys. That gives me n z mod pz Galois coverings, one for each of the integers mi. So th you know, this equation defines a z mod pz et al covering, so-called artin schneider covering. But by choosing different exponents mi, I'm able to ensure that the corresponding field extensions, ka1 to ka1, 
right? So I have n of them with n different choices of the exponents. I have n field extensions. They are linearly disjoint. So I'll get that the, if I take the composite term of all of those fields, the Galois group is z mod bz, z mod pz to the n. n was any number. So the, uh, this is certainly not a finite group. And why do the different exponents, well, you can do it directly in some fashion if you like, but there's a fancy way to see it using the so-called Swan conductor. There's something called Swan conductor which measures the wide ramification. If P doesn't divide MI, basically this MI is the Swan conductor and these things, and they're different. So since the Swan conductor are different, they must be disjoint. That's one way to see. Okay, so in any case, uh, as Dale therefore uh, remarked already, uh, if X is affine, there's no chance whatsoever that the fundamental group is finally present. It's not even finally generated. Okay. Right. So if you want to get any decent statement for non-compact X, you want to put some restriction on the type of ramification you have at the boundary, which is why the, our theorem in the end has something about tame, and I have to explain what is this tame. Right, so how does one think about tame? So here I've got a non-proper x, and I'm assuming, for example, I'm in the situation of my theorem, x is non-singular and it has a good compactification x bar. So suppose now, suppose I have a a subjection pi 1x to g for some group g, finite group g. Then I have a, a, a diagram like this. This is a g Galois et al. cover, right? No, because quotients of pi 1 correspond to such things. But now my x came with an x bar, a compactification. So I can normalize this x bar in the function field extension here and get a normal uh, variety y bar with a map to x bar, and a nice finite, finite g galois. But now this may be ramified at the boundary. So uh, let's choose y, uh, just notation, y0 contained in y bar minus y, a boundary component. And x0 equals, uh, this map, let's call it f bar, compactification of f, f bar of y0, the image component below. Then I have discrete valuation rings, O x0, x bar, O y0, y bar. This is, these are DVRs. And because both of these are normal and uh, th these are divisors, so these local rings are DVRs. So I can look at the ramification the, in the following sense. I can take the maximal ideal here, the discrete valuation here, and look at how much it's ramified there in the classical sense. That is, the, you take the maximal ideal m x naught and then multiply it by O y naught y bar. This is m y naught to the e for some power e because this is a DVR. And this e was sort of ramification index. But now we're in geometry, we're in possibly higher dimension. Uh, so the residue fields of these are function fields of subvarieties. They may not be perfect. So when I want to talk about tameness, I have to take that into account also, the residue field not being perfect. So I'll say that this extension here of DVR is tame if and only if P doesn't divide this E, this exponent, and KY0 over k x zero is separable. In general, there could be a purely inseparable part. So I call something tame if that bad phenomenon doesn't happen and p doesn't divide. So no, p isn't interfering with anything. That's what you want. So now I can define the original covering y to x. So we say 
f is tm relative to our compactification x bar if every such dvr extension is tm in this sense. This is good in some sense. It's a finite number of things to check, but it depends on the choice of a compactification. It doesn't, it's not obvious that it's intrinsic to the space X in any fashion right now. So it's natural to ask, what about if you change the compactification and so on? There are subtle issues there. Because I want to stick to the situation where my X and my X bar are non-singular, luckily we are saved by a theorem of Kurtz and Schmidt. They showed that if uh, this appeared in 2009, though I must say th this is the published reference and they have studied other notions of tameness and functoriality and various things, but the particular thing I'm going to say maybe was known to other people. I wouldn't be surprised. But uh, I mean, they've looked at other aspects of tameness. You know, uh, I'll, if people want to know a little more about that after the talk, I'll, I'll be happy to talk more about it. So the theorem is, if X has a good compactification, uh, tameness does not depend on this choice. I'm saying it a bit loosely. What it means is that if you have two good compactifications, tame with respect to one of them is identical with tame with respect to the other one. So at least in that sense, it doesn't depend on the choice. And the way they prove it is there's another notion of tameness to do with restriction to curves. That doesn't depend on any choice, and he shows the same as what you get with any given good compactification. Anyway, so if you're interested in issues to do with this ramification in higher dimension, please do take a look at this. And in particular, they haven't fully resolved all the issues. There are interesting things left there to think about. And if you know good results come out of that, I think arithmetic geometers will be able to use it. Anyway. Right. So now that I've got a notion of a tame covering, I have automatically a notion of tame fundamental group. So that's some sort of quotient. Let me just write pi 1t. This is the quotient. such that pi 1 x to g factors through uh, this pi 1 tan, this quotient, if and only if f y to x, the associated cover, is tan. Right? So tame coverings are a proper sub-collection of all coverings. So there's an associated Galois category and so on. There's a fundamental group. So that's the tame fundamental. So our theorem is about the tame fundamental group of a variety, smooth variety X, which has a good predictive compactification. Okay. There's another theorem. If we start trying to follow the growth index strategy, it says, well, you want to prove something about X, let's try to reduce the dimension to simplify the geometry as much as possible. So that too is a relatively recent, not so old result. I would have thought it's there in Grosetti, but apparently not. This was published only in 2016. So let take a good productive compactification of a non-singular X. Let uh, Z bar in X bar be a general hyperplane section. Z equals Z bar intersection X. 
then a uh, z bar meets d transversally, whatever that means. Since it's general, I can assume this, my birthday. And then I'll have a map from pi 1 tame of this z, this open z, which has a good compactification z contained in z bar. And that maps to pi 1 tame of x. So this is like uh, the sort of setup for doing a left shift theorem. And the theorem is that exactly what happens in the non-singular predictive case happens here with the tame pi 1. This is a surjection if dimension x is greater than or equal to 2 and an isomorphism if dimension x is greater than or equal to 3. Now, the tame fundamental group does have the feature which you expect uh, with fundamental groups in topology that a two-dimensional part of the space actually con determines completely the fundamental group. And that's just like in CW complexes, you need only the one skeleton and the two skeleton right, to get the... By the way, this, if you don't put tame, it's false. It's false for the affine line and the affine plane, yeah, things like that. Just Art and Schreier theory, again, just says nothing like this can, can work if you take x affine and don't put t, you don't put some condition, it's just completely wrong. For any affine variety and any divisor, pi 1 of the divisor to pi 1x is never subject <laughs> in characteristic p. So uh, left shift is hopelessly wrong without some condition of the boundary. While the ramification seems to really mess everything up. But in any case, with tame, you picture looks good again. So this says, in order to prove our theorem, without loss of generality, we can assume x is a surface or a curve, of course. And uh, I claim also the same proof which Grothendieck gave for finite generation of simple modification of that implies finite generation for the tame fundamental group. So this is basically growth and decay. The sense that once you have the left shift package, growth and decay allows you to uh, carry through everything. Uh, growth and decay has looked at tame in the case of curves and compactification of curves. Of course, curve has only one compactification, which is automatically good. And uh, he has constructed his business of specialization and so uh, yeah, this this sort of picture works even with a boundary with a divisor. And this is there in SGA somewhere. And he has constructed such a home of them. And even putting, well, here you don't put anything, but here you put tame, it's subjective. C is non proper. Uh, and put tame, this package still works. And in characteristic zero, it's, it's the same fundamental group which you had. So finite generation works the same way. That's what SGA has all this and says possibly finite presentation is going to be wrong. That's the speculation. And the last remark, which I found kind of provocative, but anyway. This business of four supposed to be. And five, we do not know any in any explicit form. Saying this badly, let me explain it again after writing it down. In other words, there, we do not know a single example of a curve of genus at least two for which we can write down a presentation. That's what I'm trying to say. It's there are no example characteristic P. Because in characteristic zero, we have a standard presentation. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to prove finite presentation, therefore, clearly, it's not by writing down any kind of presentation or doing any calculation. There has to be some other indirect method. And there is one. 
and that's somehow what was unearthed by Schusterman, colleague, and he proved in particular finite presentation holds for curves using this method, and then higher dimensions is what Ellen and I have joined the project. So there's a theorem in group theory, Lubotsky, 2001, this is very interesting, that gamma be a finitely generated pro-finite group. Then gamma is finitely presented if and only if there exists a constant c greater than 0 such that for every prime L and every finite dimensional FL gamma module, every sorry, I should put here continuous. There's a topology. Um, M, we have dimension over the finite field FL of the second group cohomology of gamma acting on M. Uh, M is a continuous gamma module. So there's a notion of group cohomology, continuous cohomology, continuous cochain, and so on. This is a finite dimensional vector space because M, the underlying vector space is finite dimensional. This should be bounded by constant times the dimension of M. The claim is, uh, if there's a constant C which doesn't depend on the prime L or the mo module in characteristic L, such that this estimate holds on second group cohomology, this is equivalent to finite presentation. So this is something to do with the theory of the sure multiplier, if you've looked at those kinds of things in group theory. So this is the criteria. Okay. So of course, our main theorem is going to be, we're going to check this. This is a condition in cohomology. We'll try to understand cohomology of spaces and prove it. But I want to explain a bit what is this criterion about? What is it trying to do for you? Why do we believe it? It's uh, quite shocking that something, this looks like very little information. So <laughs> and how do you get something out of nothing is what you, uh, you might wonder. And uh, that's what I'd like to explain next a little bit. So remarks on Lubotsky's criterion. One, for profinite groups only. No such, no similar non for abstract groups. So it's using the profinite structure in some fashion. And two, let's write gamma as F mod R. F equals pro free group on a finite set. And R closed normal circle. Hence the relations. So what Lubotsky's criterion is doing for you somehow is the following. He's really looking 
at R mod its commutator as topological F mod R equals gamma module. This is now an abelian uh, topological gamma module. And uh, I'd like to know, so he, Lubotsky's uh, criterion gives an estimate for the number of generators, of topological generators. of this uh, R mod its commutator. So how does that work? Uh, well, since the thing is abelian and we're profinite, I can work one prime at a time. So I can just look at the L adic part for each L. Then I can, and I remember I know finite generation of, of, of gamma. So I know F is a finitely generated free group. So from that, somehow I'm able to do a kind of Nakayama argument. And if you know it mod L, for each prime L, you get it L adically. And then once you can get it L adically for each L, it doesn't matter that the infinitely many primes are profinite. I can do a topology type business and close everything up. So his criterion here is really estimating the number of generators, not only of this, but he's saying for each prime L, you look at R mod RR tensor Z hat of Z mod LZ. And then he's trying to estimate the number of generators of this thing. And, you know, if it's not finally generated, I'll be able to find a sequence of things getting bigger and bigger, the Kovali sort of growing, something like that. You can imagine the type of argument. Okay, this we might believe. But what about this whole big non-abelian mess here? We haven't said anything, right? The criterion isn't telling you anything about it. So there, there's a business which I found, <laughs> it's cute, but it sort of explains what's going on. Let me just write an example. So let GI be an infinite sequence of finite simple groups, finite simple non-abelian groups. Let G be the direct product of this GA. This is a profinite group. <coughs> so now <coughs> choose let little GI in GI minus the identity uh, be any element. And let G be the infinite word in the direct product, which in the ith component is little gi. So this is a single element of the group. <laughs> so now claim the closed normal subgroup of G generated by this little g. is G itself. So I don't know anything about the group theory structure, but nonetheless, up to taking conjugates and closure, it's generated by one element. This is how it gets rid of all the non-abelian stuff, basically. All the non-abelian stuff disappears for abstract reasons. Uh, and let me explain why this is true. This is actually pretty obvious. So fix an I0 and choose H0 in G I0, take HI equals 1 for I different from I0. Fix an index I0 and choose a not, some element in that particular factor, and everywhere else uh, just choose the other elements to be 1. Let uh, H be this sequence HI, which is non-trivial only in the I0th component. And let's compute the commutator GH. So I claim this is basically the commutator of G I zero H I zero in the I zeros factor and identity in every other factor. Obviously, 
But now if I let this HI0 vary, I get all possible conjugates of this GI0 inside the factor capital G I0. But capital G I0 was a finite simple group which is non-abelian. So taking common iterators gives me everything. So I can get the entire factor just by taking this element one, this particular element, conjugating it and fiddling it around. If I can do it with one, I can do it with finitely many. Once I can do it with finitely many, I can take the limit, get all of it. So without understanding anything about the structure, I managed to generate it by one element up to topology. And that's exactly what Lubotsky has also managed to do. That's why his criteria works only in the pro-finite case. All the non-abelian stuff takes care of itself automatically in some fashion. So more carefully, you want to argue this, you have to use the so-called Fratini subgroup, which is the group theory version of the Jacobson radical. You know, it takes the non-trivial closed maximal subgroups and take the intersection, left, right, doesn't matter, just like usual Jacobson radical and so on. The quotient group is a direct product of finite simple groups. Some of them are abelian, some are non-abelian. The non-abelian ones are all gone, thanks to this. I'm left with the abelian ones. The abelian ones, well, he's giving you a criteria. Whether you have infinitely many or finitely many factors is a question, up to gamma action. And that's what he's saying the criteria tells you. So this is behind the criteria, okay? Uh, this is why one believes the criteria. Or, so then the question is, how do you check the criteria? That, of course, we get deeper into algebraic geometry. Let's try and do that. After all, it is the fundamental group over space. If I want to compute uh, some group theoretic property, I have to involve the space and its geometry in some fashion, right? So that makes sense. The only thing I know about the group is that it's pi 1 over space. So, okay. Uh, Okay, so we want to apply the Lubotsky criterion in the case where pi 1 t x is my gamma. And I do know pi 1 t x is finitely generated, thanks to the discussion earlier. So gamma is finitely generated as a pro-finite group. Now, suppose I have one of these primes L and uh, I have a, an F L gamma module M, a finite dimensional module. Obviously, the case L equal to the characteristic and L different from the characteristic are going to possibly be different. So let's first assume L is not equal to the characteristic. So P is a special prime. So let's take the L not equal to P case first. <laughs> anyway, uh, there is this question about continuous modules, by the way. Uh, if you take a general finitely generated pro-finite group, it need not be the case that any subgroup of finite index is open. But if it is pi 1 over space, this is correct. The property of the, nat the kind of groups which appear in Galois coverings, uh, this property is apparently always correct. So I don't need to bother with continuity, it's automatically satisfied. Being the fundamental group over space, this is correct. Right, so uh, let's take one of these M's. Then uh, this M is a finite dimensional vector space over a finite field, so M is a finite set. The map from gamma to the automorphisms of M, uh, the kernel has finite index, so that is some finite quotient of uh, the fundamental group. So let's choose one, any uh, quotient like this, uh, let this be any quotient. Such that gamma acts on M through G. Uh, there's a, sm a smallest possible G, namely the image of the representative, but then I have other things which are bigger and in the end, if I want to prove something about the cohomology of gamma, I have to take some sort of limit over coverings. What I'm saying is it's enough to take coverings of this kind, that they are uh, co-final among all coverings. Okay, so let's choose one such thing. Then let's look at the geometric diagram I get out of this. And remember, I've already assumed x is of dimension two because uh, of uh, the left shed theorem. 
And by the way, if X is of dimension one, this is H2 of something, you're able to somehow manage it quickly. That's what Schusterman did uh, first and he was, uh, became aware somehow of this Lubotsky criterion that it can be useful in algebraic geometry and that was his earlier work. And then higher dimensions, of course, you have to do more algebraic geometry. So let's look at this diagram, which we get in a natural way out of uh, the picture. Then, of course, uh, G acts on this space Y bar and X bar is the quotient space. <coughs> Here it acts without fixed points, but there it may have fixed points on the boundary. And M is a G module, so I can think of M Y bar be the trivial uh, et al local system on Y bar with G action. I mean, trivial local system is basically just the product Y bar cross M. G acts on Y bar, G acts on M, it of course it acts on the product. So that's obvious, that's what this is doing. But now the part is I can look at MY equals MY bar restricted to Y, it's the same, similar type of analysis. But now the action is free, and so there's a descent to a local system on X. And now this is some object appearing in algebraic geometry. I have a sheaf on, on the space X. I can talk of the cohomology of X with coefficients of this sheaf. And then I claim that uh, one H1 gamma M is in fact isomorphic to H1 et al of the space X with coefficients in the sheaf. And secondly, H2 gamma M, really the thing I'm interested in, sits inside H2 et al X. So I can control the cohomology. I'm trying to understand the group cohomology by et al cohomology. Now, uh, let me see. I think in the interest of time, and the, I, I, let me not go into the proof. It's not difficult for, again, people interested, I'll, I'll be happy to sketch it after. But and for this audience, just take it for granted right now. Or maybe I'll hand wave in the following fashion. If you were similarly working in topology, you'd have a universal covering space X tilde. When you pull back anything to the universal covering, it's the trivial local system, but the fundamental group is also trivial. The H1 of the universal covering is also trivial. So write a spectral sequence giving descent for the action of the fundamental group on the cohomology of the universal cover converging to the cohomology of the space X. And then when you do that, and you know, but the universal cover has no H1. So some terms are zero in the spectral sequence. And the right, correct term is zero in the right place to ensure these two things. And you write the five term you know, exact sequence or low degree terms, whatever it is, uh, this will map to that, and then it will map to the thing which I said is zero, and it will map to this, so yeah, this follows. For those who have seen such arguments, uh, that's a proof, basically. And then you have to make it eta, which you can do. But anyway, let's take these things. So, this tells me that I want to bound this object, local cohomology of this x. So, how do we try to do that? There are various tricks there. Let me just see. Okay, again, Looking at the time and the context, maybe I should not spend too much time on this. Just say we can do various reductions. So you can take x and you can take x minus a hyperplane section and try to con compare the cohomology of x and the cohomology of this open set, writing a long exact sequence with local cohomology. I claim the local cohomology terms are trivial for some obvious reasons. They're, they're bounded in some stupid way. So you, can, you are able to replace x by this big open set. And instead of computing the cohomology of x, I'll compute the cohomology of this thing. But this thing has the advantage if h is a hyperplane section, so this is affine. Remember, our x had a good compactification with a nice Cartier divisor of the boundary. If I take a general hyperplane section, this new guy looks like uh, a predictive variety minus the old divisor plus a new one. But then one knows this is affine for various reasons. X is a surface, remember. So once this is affine, therefore I mean, I, I can assume without loss of generality that X is affine. Not just a surface, it's affine. Once it's affine, I can say that it's et al. cohomological dimension is two, or at most two. 
by, for example, in characteristic zero, it would say it's a Stein manifold. So the cohomological dimension is bounded by the, the complex dimension. So the algebraic version of that is correct. It's called Artin's theorem, vanishing theorem et al. Cohomology. So I also claim because the fundamental group is, the tame fundamental group is finitely generated, there's no problem with the H naught and the H1. H naught of any local system is bounded by the rank for stupid reasons. H1 of a local system is bounded by rank times the number of generators of the group. Because an element of H1 comes from a one co-cycle, a value of one co-cycle is determined by knowing the values of the generators. Of course, everything is topological and limits and so on, but let's not worry about it. Those things work. So bounding H2 is the same as bounding the Euler characteristic. Bounding the Euler characteristic, then Deline has proved now you have to use heavy things proved by Deline. He says that Euler characteristic of a tame local system is equal to the Euler characteristic of the trivial local system times the rank of the tame local system. This is for Euler characteristic, only and only for tame local systems. If it's not tame, then you have to under, worry about swan conductors and boundary the nasty things happen. But we are tame in our series. Then uh, the trivial local system, you say, well, okay, it's trivial, right? The rank is one. So it's just some invariant of the SpaceX. But there's a prime L involved. I have to check whatever the, the chi, which I got with FL coefficients. So X is affine. And we have chi of uh, the trivial local chi X FL, the trivial local system. And I want to know that this chi is, there's a constant C bounding the chi. That's the type of thing I want. Uh, but in fact, this chi, if you think about it, is the same as chi xql yeah. for homological algebra reasons because... So it's time. Yeah. My time is over. Okay. Yeah. One more minute. Okay. Fine. Doesn't matter. So uh, then you have to use Deline's proof of the whale conjectures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this comes from the zeta function. Once you put ql and whale conjectures, take care. The interesting thing really technically is the p part, but let's leave that to experts who some, some people want to hear about it. I can tell Thank you. So, because of time, so we uh, we in, uh, discuss. Uh, we ask uh, the speaker after the after the talk. So okay, and, and after the talk of uh, last. So we have two minutes for the preparation of the last talk. 